And we are going to continue in Colossians today. So if you have your Bible and want to turn to Colossians chapter 4, um, that is where we are going to be uh, uh, studying from. Uh, it's where I'm going to be preaching from this morning. Before we do that, however, or as we're doing that, let me just ask you a question. How many of you have seen the movie Dead Poets Society? Anybody seen Dead Poets Society? All right. Came out a ways back. Uh, Robin Williams plays the role of a teacher who's, uh, who's trying to lead his students into a, a greater sense of, uh, of the excitement of, 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 of uh, doing what they do, of, of shining brightly in the world. In fact, in order to do that, on the first day of school, he takes all of the class of boys out to the hallway, and he takes them to look at pictures of the past. He looks at pictures of those who have gone before, who are now dead, graduates of the school who have died from the past. He motivates them to learn and to excel in life with the following words. This is what he says as they're looking at these students from the past. He says, we are food for worms. What a great motivation. <laughs> we, we are food from worms, food for worms, lads. Believe it or not, each and every one of us in this room one day will stop breathing, turn cold, and die. Step forward and see these faces from the past. They were just like you are now. They believed they were destined for great things. Their eyes are full of hope. But you see, gentlemen, these boys are now fertilizing daffodils. If you listen real close, you will hear them whisper their legacy to you. Lean in. What do you hear? Then Robin Williams says in an eerie, gravel-like voice, Carpe diem. Seize the day, boys. Make your lives extraordinary. I think that's good advice, not just for school, but for Christians. It's, it's good advice for, for, for all of us. We, we need to seize the day because the stakes are much higher than just being worm food. The stakes are much higher than just being fertilizer for daffodils. What we do today and every day of our lives has, has, the, uh, has the ability to make an eternal difference. An eternal difference. We can change people's eternal destination from hell to heaven. They can find eternal, eternal joy instead of eternal punishment. We can seize the day and proclaim salvation over damnation. How many of you remember, how many of you remember the challenge Jesus gave to his disciples? By the way, when he gave this challenge to his disciples, he was not just giving it to those disciples that were here, there on, on his day, but all disciples that would come after them as well, which means this challenge was for us as well. And it's a challenge that he gave right before he ascended to be back with the Father. And you are familiar with it because we have named this challenge. We have called it the Great Commission. And this is what Jesus says. He says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Listen, I want you to understand this morning, if you are a Christian, if you have placed your life in the hand of Jesus Christ, if you accepted the gift that he has given us, and, and you are obediently serving him, then you must be a disciple maker. There is no way around it. You have to be a disciple maker. That is what he has called you and me to be, to be disciple makers. You and I have been given a mission, and our mission is to go find people who do not know Jesus and to introduce them to Jesus. And if they accept the message of Jesus, then we're supposed to help bring them closer and closer to Jesus. That is what we've been called to do. Let me ask you a question. When you look at your family, what do you see? When you sit across the break table at work, what do you see? When you walk through your neighborhood, what do you see? When you're sitting in class surrounded by your peers, what do you see? What do you see? Well, I'm hoping that you see your mission field. 
30 plus years ago, two shoe salesmen were sent to Nigeria to survey the country for the possibility of building a shoe factory there. The first man came back and he said, few people here wear shoes, so there is little need to build a new shoe factory in Nigeria. The second man came back to London and he said, this is the greatest opportunity we have ever had. Everybody I saw needs a good pair of shoes. What do you see? When, you, when you're looking at the people you know, what do you see? Do you see your mission field or not? See, the challenge of our text today is to see a mission field, to start viewing the world from the, from the, from the perspective that God has, that, that, that you want to save as many as who will possibly accept and come. To look at the opportunities around you as opportunities to share Jesus, to seize this day for the mission you've been placed on. Now I know as soon as I started saying that, that there are going to be thoughts in your mind and you may not express them verbally, but there's something like this. Well, wait a minute, Todd. I don't know how to. Or I don't feel comfortable. Or I'm not sure I'm ready. Or I'm too scared of what people might think about me. Well, I want to try to help put your mind at ease. So let's look at our text this morning, Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 2, and let's see what it says, because I think it can help us on our journey toward our mission. Colossians chapter 4, starting in verse 2. Colossians 4, starting in verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. Pray for us, too, that God will give us many opportunities to speak about his mysterious plan concerning Christ. That is why I am here in chains. Pray that I should proclaim this message as clearly as I should. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. So you will have the right response for everyone. In these five verses, we are given, Paul provides for us, God provides for us through Paul's words, some, some steps to effectively accomplish the mission we've been placed on. And hopefully I can present them to you in such a way that you will not only grab hold of them, but you will be able to easily remember them and put them into practice in your life. And with that goal in mind, I started to think back about some things I learned as a little child. Maybe you learned this little, um, I'm not sure what you would even call it, this little slogan or, or, or motto. It goes like this, stop, look, and listen before you cross the street. Use your eyes and use your ears, and then you use your feet. Now, it had a little ditty you went along with, and there was more to it than that. That's all I remember of it. But it was stop, look, and listen. It, it was a way in which you were supposed to remember, don't just run out into the street. Stop, look, and listen. Well, today, my hope is I can give you three words that will also be engraved in your heart and on your mind, and you will be able to remember them, and you will be able to put them into practice when it comes to fulfilling the Great Commission. And the first word is, in fact, stop. 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 We need to do what Paul asked us to do here. We need to do what God is calling for us to do. We need to stop and to pray. This is critical because we often overlook this step. We often jump into the increasing current of our life and try to accomplish all that we can accomplish in our own strength battling against this current. And we only really stop and pray when things get so bad that we cannot accomplish them on our own. That's when we stop, but that's not when we should stop. We should stop before we even start and pray. We need to live our lives differently, and that means we need to be praying. We need to be praying. We need to pray for ourselves that we can proclaim the good news about Jesus Christ effectively. We need to be praying for each other every single day that each of us can proclaim the good news of Jesus effect effectively. We need to be asking God to each morning throughout that day to place on, before our eyes the opportunities that he is uh, putting before us that we can see them and take advantage of them and share what he has done for us in the midst of those opportunities. We need to stop and pray. How many of us, the minute our alarm clock goes off or the minute we open our eyes in the morning, we get up out of bed, we run in, we take our shower, we go and eat our breakfast, we sit down with the newspaper or we jump in the car and we run to work and we forget to even think about praying. We don't even give it a second thought. 
Halfway through the day, we might say a prayer when we get to the lunchtime, you know, that, God, thank you for this food. And we do that quickly, you know. Thank you for this meat, let me eat, you know. But we don't really make a priority out of prayer. We don't really pray for ourselves. We don't really pray for each other that we will see the opportunities God is putting before us. In Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 13, one day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. This is just one verse of many verses that show us that Jesus is constantly making a priority out of prayer. Even before he chooses the 12 that he wants to kind of be the leaders of the mission when he is gone, he, he talks to God. He talks to God about it. Prayer, prayer is not just an activity of devotion we do to show we are real Christians. There is an unimaginable power in prayer. There, there, the, the, when, we, when we pray, we are being ushered right into the very throne room of God. Do you understand that? When, you're being, when you pray, it's as if you picked up the red phone and you're, the other end of the red phone is, is right on God's table. Our text calls us to be devoted to prayer. And my question is, are you praying for opportunities to share Jesus? Are you praying for the ability to be bold in your proclamation of the good news? Are you praying like Paul prayed for clarity so that you can say what needs to be said well? Are you praying that you can be an effective disciple maker for the Lord? That's what we're called to be. A government man was taking geological readings for the Department of the Interior, and he approached one farmer and he said, hey, I've been authorized by the government to go out into your pasture and take some readings. Do you mind if I do that? The farmer said, you can't go out into my pasture. The government man got a little perturbed and, and brought out a piece of paper signed by the Secretary of the Interior that gave him the authority to take his readings anywhere he chose. He showed it to the farmer and he said, There, see, I have authority to go into your pasture. As the government man started climbing over the fence, the farmer said, I'll tell you again, you better not go into my pasture. The government man arrived in the middle of the pasture and was setting up his equipment. When all of a sudden the ground began shaking around him, he looked up and he saw a mean old bull running toward him with his head lowered. The government man forgot his equipment and started running as fast as he could toward the fence. He cried out to the farmer, help me, help me. And the farmer said, well, just show him your papers. <laughs> the government man had the authority but he didn't have the power to be in that field. But this is what I want you to understand. You and I have been given both authority and power to be out in the harvest fields of the lost. You and I have been given the authority and the power to be there. In fact, Jesus says in John 15, 16, you didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask for using my name. Jesus says, I've given you the authority to go out there and do it, and I've given you the power to go out there and do it. And one of the main things we need to know is that we need to be asking God, because in that asking, we are connecting to the power to proclaim what we've been called to proclaim. So the first thing we need to do is we need to stop. We need to stop and pray. First word, stop. Second word, we need to walk Walk is the second word. Walk. Now I want you to listen again to verse 5 of our text. Here it is. Walk. Live wisely among those who are not believers and make the most of every opportunity. Live wisely among unbelievers. That is another way, or at least I am choosing another way of saying that, and that is that you and I, if we want to live wisely amongst unbelievers, we need to walk the walk. Instead of just talking the talk, we need to walk the walk. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12 says it like this. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior, and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. Now, one chapter later... 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Then if people speak against you, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ. 
I think it's important that we just get real this morning. We just are completely transparent and honest. It is easy to look like a Christian here this morning. That's the truth. You can come this morning, and as long as you don't say too much, people are going to think, well, they must be a Christian. Now, if we say too much, all of a sudden they really see the overflow of our heart, and they might get the realization of who we might really be. But it's easy to be a Christian here. It's easy to say the right things here. It's easy to do the right things here. But that's not where you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged by how you do all those things out there, beyond the walls of this pavilion or beyond the poles of those tents or beyond the walls of your house if you're at home. That's where it's going to matter. How are you living out there? Now, I'm not saying don't live well here. I'm just saying make sure that the way you're living now is the way you're living every single day, every moment of your life. How are you living? How are you living your life? John Wesley was a popular evangelist in in early America. He would ride from one church to another on a horse so he could preach from one place to another. On one such uh, journey, he was stopped by a highwayman. Now, if you don't know what a highwayman is, a highwayman was someone who was there to rob you. He shouted to him, halt, give me your money or your life. Wesley got down off his horse and he emptied his pockets, revealing just a handful of coins. He invited the robber to look through all of his saddlebags on the horses, uh, which were only carrying his books. In disgust, the thief turned away and was leaving, and all of a sudden, John Wesley cried out to him. He said, stop, I have something more for you. Puzzled, the robber turned back, and Wesley leaned towards him and said, my friend, you may live to regret this sort of life in which you are engaged. If you do, if you ever do, I beseech you to remember this. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. The robber hurried silently away. Wesley got back on his horse and rode toward the next preaching stop. But on his way, he continued to pray for this man, praying, that the, that, praying in his heart that this man would be touched by the word of God. Years later, At the close of a Sunday evening service, a stranger stepped forward and earnestly begged to speak with John Wesley. When he finally got close, Wesley recognized him as the robber who had stolen from him so long ago. Now he was a tradesman. Better still, he was a child of God. He raised Wesley's hands to his lips and he affectionately kissed it and said in deep emotion, To you, dear sir, I owe it all. Wesley replied softly, Nay, nay, my friend. Not to me, but to the precious blood of Christ, which cleanses us from all sin. I don't know about you, but that's making the most of every opportunity. I mean, witnessing to the man who is robbing you? I mean, that is walking the walk for the Lord. What about you and me? When our neighbor is constantly harassing us, how are we responding to them? Are we witnessing? Are we showing them Christ? What are we showing them? How about when our coworker is taking credit for our work? How are we responding to that? Or when a family member is abusing our generosity? Or when a stranger takes our property? What do we see in those? Do we see them as an opportunity to share Jesus or not? Matthew 5, Jesus says, You are the light of the world like a city on a hilltop that cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a lamp is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, he says, let your good deeds shine out for all to see so that everyone will praise your heavenly Father. I want you to understand as a Christian, you are shining in this world. Now here's the key. You will either be known for shining for the good deeds that you do, or you will be known for shining for the bad deeds. Either way, our deeds will be seen. Make sure you're walking the walk. It's time to stop and pray. It's time to walk the walk. And the third thing, the last thing, is it's time for us to talk. It's time for us to talk. So it's stop, walk, and talk. In case you were wondering what the three words are, there they are. Stop, walk, and talk. So many Christians want to stop at living their life well and make that their entire witness. 
They have this unrealistic belief that I can live a godly enough life that in, its, uh, in and of itself, it will be enough to convince people to come to the Lord. They have this idea that, that they can just live good enough that people will want to come to Jesus Christ. But the truth is, living a godly life is the foundation we must have so that we can speak about Jesus Christ. You, you don't live a godly life to think that that is in by itself your witness. It just allows you to be a witness. In fact, in verse 6, it says, let your conversation be gracious and attractive so that you will have the right response for everyone. Two verses before that, it says, pray that I will proclaim this message as clearly as I should. A silent Christian is an ineffective Christian. I want you to understand that. A silent Christian is an ineffective Christian. Our commission cannot be accomplished by a lifelong game of charades. You have to speak up. You have to proclaim the truth. You have to tell people about Jesus Christ. One day a lady criticized D.L. Moody She criticized him. She said, your methods of evangelism and attempting to win people is is pathetic. She didn't like the way he was trying to win people to the Lord. Moody replied, I agree with you. I don't like the way I do it either. Tell me how you do it. The lady replied, I don't do it. Moody retorted, then I like the way I'm doing it better than the way you're doing it. Listen, you don't have to know everything. You don't have to do everything correctly. You don't have to have the right system. You don't even have to know a system. What you have to do is care enough about people to share Jesus Christ. That's it. That's it. Speak up for Jesus. Don't sit idly by. Don't sit quietly by. Share Jesus Christ with people. You and I have been called to be Jesus' witnesses. Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses. Telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. You know what I love about that passage? A lot of things I love about that passage. One of the things I love about that passage is that you and I have been called to be what? We've been called to be witnesses. Do you know what a witness does in a trial? A witness just proclaims what has happened in their life, what they have experienced, what they have seen, and what they have heard. That's what they proclaim. You've not been called to be judge. You've not been called to be attorney. You've just been called to be witness. And by the way, if Jesus has done anything in your life, then you have something to tell. If Jesus has done anything in your life, then you have something to tell. And if you are like me and Jesus has done so very much in your life, then you have so many things to tell. So many things you can share with other people. By the way, not only are you a witness of Jesus Christ, but you are his representative. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says this, For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, no longer counting people's sins against them. Praise God. And he gave us this message, wonderful message of reconciliation. So we are Christ's ambassadors. God is making his appeal through us. We speak for Christ when we plead, come back to God. You and I have been called to speak up for Jesus. We have to tell others about the hope that we have found in Jesus. We must talk about what Jesus is doing in our lives and what Jesus can do in their lives. That is our call. That is our commission. That is what Jesus has, has, has said to each and every one of us. You, you are on my team. You are my representative. You are my witness. Heard the story about a soft-spoken man who always rode the commuter train that was uh, on the Long Island Railroad. He, he was on the 5 o'clock local. Every evening after the train began its journey, he would begin his journey. And he would journey through the car that he had seated himself in. He would go from the front of the car to the back of the car. And in each and every seat, he would stop and he would say, Excuse me, but if any of your friends are blind, tell them to consult Dr. Garl because he restored my sight. Every day, every person, he would mention that. Talk to, talk, talk to Dr. Garl because he restored my sight. That was good news to him. He had been blind and now he could see. Think about the good news for you and me. We were dead and now we live. 
We were condemned, and now we have salvation. We were without hope, and now we have all the hope. Shouldn't we be telling others about Jesus Christ? How can we know such great news and not share it? If we won't speak up for Jesus, then how can we expect Him to speak up for us? One of the scariest verses in the Bible is found in Matthew chapter 10, at least in my estimation. It says, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. By the way, that's not the scary verse. The next verse is a scary verse, and I didn't put it on the screen. But he says, whoever doesn't acknowledge me, then I won't acknowledge. By the way, a few verses before that, verse 27, he says this, What I tell you now in the darkness, shout abroad when day, daybreak comes. What I whisper in your ears, shout from the housetops for all to hear. Our world needs to hear you and me speaking up for Jesus Christ, sharing what Jesus has done, shouting the good news about who Jesus is and who we can be because of what he has done. And the question is, will you do it? It is time for us to stop. It is time for us to walk. It is time for us to to talk. I want to share one last story with you. Charles Spurgeon. I don't know if you know who Charles Spurgeon is, but Charles Spurgeon first went to Park Street Church in London when he was 19 years old. When he got there, he found that a church that would hold 1,500 people, had seating for 1,500 people, had less than 200 people there. Nine years later, The Metropolitan Tabernacle was built to accommodate the crowds that came to hear him preach. His sermons were published in newspapers around the world. A school had been uh, established to train ministers. And a business was started to print evangelistic booklets. It was said that over 23,000 people had heard him preach during those years. During Spurgeon's 38 years as pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, his congregation included 6,000 worshipers and added 14,000 members. Clearly, the Metropolitan Tabernacle was one of the most influential churches of the 19th century. However, in 1972, 75 years after Spurgeon retired, some ministers visited this church. And when they got there, they counted only 87 worshipers on a Sunday morning service. What had happened to this church? This once great church. How did this church lose its influence? Now, many explanations were proposed. Well, London had changed, or people had changed, or the church didn't keep up with the times, or it should have moved into the suburbs, and on and on and on they went. But the truth is, the simple truth is, this church fell away, lost its influence, because this church lost its focus, was no longer interested in witnessing, and it lost its focus. Did you know we're only one generation away from irrelevancy and extinction as a church? And we're always only one generation away. We must not let that happen in our generation. It is up to you. It is up to me to accomplish the great commission. It is up to you and me to reach out into our communities, to reach out to our co-workers, to reach out to our family, family members, and by the way, to reach out even to those who we would consider enemies. It is up to you and me to share with them Jesus and what he has done in our lives. It is time for us to stop and pray so that we can walk the walk and that we would have boldness to talk for Jesus Christ. That is how we get it done. And the question is, are you and I going to do it? It's time to fulfill the mission. It's time to get out there and proclaim what Jesus has done in our lives. In fact, as I look at our world, there's no better time, no greater time, more important time than right now to share Jesus.